actinic keratosis, are they precancerous lesions? Are they precancer or they are in situ, SCCs? So who votes for precancerous lesion? Okay, who votes for, uh, for uh, in situ squamous cell? Yeah, both. <laughs> well, in my view, uh, clearly, uh, whatever we like to call them, you know, but there is a fact. You know why we call uh, today lentigo maligna melanoma in situ? Why we say melanoma in situ, in situ instead of lentigo maligna? It's because of this guy, Ackerman, you know? Uh, this dermatopathologist was very, very wise, very intelligent, and he realized that, I mean, uh, the definitely, definitely, this is not a precancerous lesion, you know, like it was supposed to be before, you know, lentigo maligna. This is actually a melanoma in situ. So, and uh, let's say, uh, in parallel, uh, actinic keratosis is more or less a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, okay? This does not mean that uh, every actinic keratosis should become an invasive squamous cell carcinoma, no? We know very well that many, many of them are, are, are not becoming invasive, of course. The point is that it's biologically a continuum, you know? Squamous cell carcinoma is here, yeah? But this is uh, uh, actinic keratosis. So it's the same biologi uh, morphologic spectrum, and it's also biologically, ma uh, genetically the same. These are the, uh, let's say, the um, genetic alterations you can find in squamous cell carcinoma, you know? And these are the genes which are working more, and these are the genes which are working less, okay? And this is normal skin on the other side. And you can see that actinic keratosis is just a little bit less. But so the quantity of gene alterations is, is less, but the quality is the same, OK? So that means that it's just you know, the, uh, a unique spectrum, just the same spectrum of, of, of problem. So uh, it's basically a form of in situ squamous cell carcinoma, but of course, we know that many of them are never becoming invasive. How many are becoming invasive? How many? Well, today we know a little bit better, but we don't actually know exactly how many, okay? Here, there are some uh, numbers written, which means, yeah, overall, what is written in the literature is that basically, one actinic keratosis is developing every two years in a patient who has 100 actinic keratosis, okay? So it's 0.5% per year, okay? So if a patient has one actinic keratosis, what is the probability? Nothing, you know? But if a patient has 100 actinic keratosis, then it's one squamous cell carcinoma invasive every two years, which is a lot, you know? So th it means that this guy will develop for sure some, sometimes a squamous cell carcinoma. You know what I mean? So it's the qu again a matter of number, okay? So I don't care too much to treat a patient with a single actinic keratosis. What I care to treat is this guy with 100 and more than 100 actinic keratosis because it, this guy has a true risk to develop an invasive squamous cell carcinoma, okay? And so, <coughs> Should I then treat um, uh, what kind of actinic keratosis? Just the more hypertrophic ones or also the beginning ones? Well, again, who knows which one will develop into invasive squamous cell carcinoma? We don't know. So we actually think that this type of actinic keratosis is developing more easily into invasive squamous cell, but it actually is not true. I will tell you why, okay? So actually we know that we have three types of actinic keratosis, uh, type one, type two, and type three, okay? But this is histologically, this is histological type one, type two, type three. Okay, but the histological type 1, 2, and 3 does not correspond to the clinical type 1, type 2, and type 3. Okay, clinically, we just use 
one criterion to do to say one, two, three. And this is the hyperkeratosis, the amount of hyperkeratosis. But this does not correspond to the histologic atypia. Okay? So it, clinically we know that this is type one, this is type two, a little bit more hyperkeratotic, and this is type three, more hy uh, hyperkeratosis. Okay? And on, of course, uh, we use this kind of classification to understand a little bit better, but definitely this does not mean too much, you know? So clinically, we could not pr uh, pr predict which is the lesion which is going to be invasive, you know? So that's why we have to treat all of them, okay? So that's a little bit the problem. So here, we do we have diagnosis to diagnose this lesion as a clinic keratosis? No. I mean, of course, it's clear cut, okay? But of course, we have also the dermoscopy, which is confirming what is the phase of a skin of a type one actinic keratosis. This one, no, this kind of reticular uh, vessels and these white follicles in the center. Okay, the strawberry pattern. Okay, so it's easy. That's that's the strawberry pattern. Okay, so now. This is extremely easy also clinically, but sometimes it's a little bit more difficult, especially when we are dealing with pigmented actinic keratosis and we saw the difficulties, you know, especially on the face. So these are all the criteria we can find in actinic keratosis. Red pseudo network, white follicles, rosettes, scales, and pigmented scales. So superficial pigmented lines, as I showed you before, no? Okay, so reticular uh, erythema, uh, rosettes, huh? you see how many rosettes are inside here, okay, this is again actinic keratosis type 1, and there is a little bit of uh, uh, hyperkeratosis, and again the reticular vessels, okay, so very easy, this is more hypertrophic, so it's skin type, um, type 2 actinic keratosis and we see more hyperkeratosis in the moscopy as well okay so erythema white follicles and so on and there's of course type 3 okay lots of hyperkeratosis and again you, we can see it demoscopically the same so I mean clinical demoscopic it's very easy the only problem as I told you okay this is another example of, of type 3 actinic keratosis. Uh, the only problem is when we have pigment. But uh, there is a little bit another problem, you know, which is in my view solved also with the help of thermoscopy. How to distinguish an actinic keratosis from squamous cell carcinoma invasive. Yeah? Because sometimes it's not so easy. So let's see. For example, this guy has a, a couple of actinic keratosis on the scalp and this is what we can see. It's a flat lesion, yeah, with erythema and white follicles. So, for the moment, I'm uh, I'm thinking about actinic keratosis. I have no clinical nor dermoscopic clues to think about invasive squamous cell carcinoma. But this is another lesion, yeah. You see that there is a little bit of elevation at the periphery. This is already clinically relevant, and there is what in the center. Yeah, it's it's a kind of ulceration in the center. So it's not anymore hyperkeratosis, but it's already ulceration. Okay, so already clinically we can understand. And the moscopy, it's basically going from this to this. So from white circles to white structureless areas. So the white color becomes more relevant. Okay, and then the reticular vessels are becoming polymorphous vessels. And then the scale crusts are becoming ulceration. Okay, so that's basically what we find also dermoscopically. And that's the lesion when we look dermoscopically. You see that we have white follicles still, but also white structureless areas. Okay, and instead of seeing hyperkeratosis, we see ulceration in the center. So this is already an early invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Okay, so as I told you, if there is pigment, the lesion is becoming a little bit more problematic to be diagnosed. Of course, we always start from the clinical side, and clinically, an actinic keratosis should be a little bit hyperkeratotic, you know? It's a rough surface, while melanoma 
does not show a rough surface, okay? Then, demoscopically, we have erythema, white follicles, a little bit of brown pigment, but still we are in line with uh, an actinic keratosis. Here we see so, so, uh, so much uh, scales, so we are on the safe side, okay? I, this is the lesion I showed you also before, and here you see, the, again, these uh, superficial pigmented lines, these kind of uh, pigmented scales. And uh, here someone asked me, but it's a little bit difficult to differentiate from uh, melanin, you know, because this is scales, how can we differentiate from uh, the network we see in melanoma? Well, it, it's, on the picture it's more difficult. When you see it on the patient, you see that this is uh, pigmentation which is very, very superficial. Very, very superficial. Okay? Then look at this guy, how happy is he to, take a, to make a picture? <laughs> okay? So is this melanoma or pigmented thin keratosis? I think it's pigmented thin keratosis. Why? Because I see erythema, some kind of blood here, uh, rosettes, uh, pigmented uh, superficial lines, so this must be scales. And then also here, maybe there is a little bit of solar lentigo because of the sharp demarcation. So overall, I think this is, a, uh, this is not melanoma. Another lesion here, in, of course, a patient with multiple easy to diagnose actinic keratosis here and here, but also let, let, let's give a look to this one. Well, yeah, okay, again, superficial lines, yeah? These are scales and white follicles. Okay, so very. The criteria work. Okay, another guy, easy, actinic keratosis, white follicles, reticular vessels, but there are some more lesions. Yeah, and here you see erythema, white follicles, but here, yeah, superficial lines. Yeah, pigmented hyperkeratosis. Okay. Okay, another lesion. Clinically, already, we can think about the lesion because it's not rough. It's not, you know, hyperkeratotic. And here, we don't see the beautiful criteria we expect to find. We don't see white follicles. This is not white follicles. Yeah? This is just follicles, but not white. Yeah? And then we don't see erythema too much. We, these are normal vessels around. So overall, this is a lesion which is looking more like a lentigo maligna and not anymore like a pigmented actinic keratosis. Okay, so this was from a diagnostic point of view. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, let's go back for a moment about, and the question is, which type of actinic keratosis develops into invasive? Well, as I told you, in my view, we should forget this. Yeah, Type one, type two, type three, invasive. Yes, okay, it's possible, yeah? But it's not always like this, okay? First of all, as I told you, these grades, histologic grades one, two, and three, does not correspond to the clinical grades, okay? So we can forget this, yeah? This is not working, okay? But of course, it could be possible that a type three actinic keratosis becomes invasive because there are more atypical cells. Quantitatively, so the quantity of atypical cells is more than in type one. But in this study, which was published a few years ago, in 2014 or 15, no, 15, um, they found out that the great majority of squamous cell carcinomas are found associated with type one actinic keratosis, okay? The great majority, okay? So it could be like this, classic pathway, type one, type two, type three, invasive, but it could be also the other side, okay? Type one, and then, poof, down, okay? So, type one, type two, type three, doesn't, doesn't work, yeah? Doesn't mean anything. Clinically, we don't predict, and, and, and also, biologically, it's not relevant, okay? What, at the end of the day, we have to do is to treat everything, you know? So, 
Again, I don't speak about a patient with one actinic keratosis. Forget about it, okay? This is not really important. What we like to treat is a scalp like this, yeah? Full of actinic keratosis uh, with a big uh, field cancerization, yeah? So where there are lots, millions or billions of dysplastic keratinocytes, and in front of this uh, of this scalp, we have to go stepwise. Okay, so first we have to treat eventually the more suspicious lesion surgically. Okay, and this guy had a, a squamous cell carcinoma here. Okay, so we uh, use the clinical elevation and the endoscopy to uh, to uh, to see if the lesion could be a squamous cell carcinoma. Then. Once we remove the squamous cell carcinoma, what should we do? We have to treat the single actinic keratosis, and third, we have to treat the feet, okay? Or the entire scalp, basically, okay? So that's what we have to do, okay? Of course, our aim is to bring this patient to this situation. <laughs> well, not so easy, <laughs> okay? So what should we do here? Okay, let's concentrate first on what is urgent. What is urgent? This one. Yeah? This is a squamous cell carcinoma. So, surgery. Punto. And then what should we do? Treat all the rest. First, or uh, uh, the, 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 the actinic keratosis and then the feet. Okay? So what are our um, weapons? Okay, we have many. We have cryotherapy. We have photodynamic therapy. We have five fluorouracil, we have imikimod, we have diclofenac, we have ingenol, we have more, we have daylight PDT, you know there is a new type of daylight uh, of PDT that you, you do outside, no? And then we have also other things, salicylic acid, I use it a lot, yeah, to clean a little bit. And then we also have retinoids, local topical retinoids but also systemic retinoids yeah so let's make an example this is a guy with a very nice scalp yeah so what is urgent this one yeah this is urgent it could be squamous cell carcinoma why because it's ulcerated this is a crust so <clears throat> surgery squamous cell carcinoma then we used salicylic acid yeah to remove let's say the scales, and this is already much better, yeah? Uh, which con concentration from 10 to 20%, yeah, yeah. Um, of course, you can see here the graft we did for the squamous cell carcinoma, then after cleaning everything, in this particular case, we used imikimod, very good. After three weeks, <laughs> the patient will be scared, but you must be happy. Yeah, the more you see, the better is the treatment. Okay, so whenever the patient is coming and say, "Doctor, I, 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 I'm almost dying," you know, I think that my my situation is worsening, and then we have to convince him, "No, come on, this is great. It means that you will, everything will disappear." Okay, and in fact, everything disappeared. Come on. It's not a bad result here, yeah? Okay, in this particular patient with thousands and thousands of actinic keratosis, uh, by the way, many of these, of these lesions were induced by this medication, hydrosiurea, yeah? This is a uh, medication which is very commonly used for patients with polycythemia, okay? So this is one of these medications which are uh, using a, 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 a tiny keratosis and then we used acitrocin 25 milligrams per day for many months and the result is not so bad I would say yeah okay so at the end of the day this is the last slide that's basically our protocol since we have so many medications we have to find a place a, re a rational place for everything okay and this is basically what we do, okay? 
Uh, we are not speaking too much about uh, 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 systemic retinoids because this is for very hard cases like this one. So not so many patients are going under retinoids. But basically, that's what we do. When we have a patient with many, many, many actinic keratosis, we start with PDT. Yeah? And then, even before cryo, yeah? So, and then when we clean the majority, then we use cryo for the, for the remaining, or in miqui mode, or in genol, or daylight PDT, okay? So daylight PDT is much less useful than conventional PDT, okay? When we have patients with not so many actinic keratosis, then we can think about doing immediately miqui mode, in genol, associated with cryo or not, okay? And then, when everything is cleaned, then we go to the maintenance, yeah? We have to maintain the treatment. Why? Because if we don't do anything, the great majority of patients will recure in six months, yeah? So we have to do something. And what we can do? We can do many things. We can do sunscreens, of course. We can do fun, fun, fancy things like polypodium leucotomus. I don't know if you heard about it. We can use also nicotinamide. Nicotinamide. Yeah? Um, we can use piroxicam. We can use diclofenac. Yeah? So diclofenac is really, so, so, uh, so la is, yeah, is not really for treating the, the lesions, but for maintaining the result, okay? Because it doesn't work too well for treating, okay? So this is basically what we do, and uh, thank you.